back to another episode of The Shepherd's Heart. This season, we've been focusing in on parables, the parables of Yeshua. And uh, we've been learning a lot, yes, talking a lot, and wrestling through some topics. <laughs> and so we're just going to dive right in. I'm glad you're with us. Let's take a look. I'm in Luke chapter 12. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master put in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he is not aware, and will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready, or does not do what the master wants, will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. All right, there's a lot going on yeah, in there. Yes. <laughs> As I like to do, if you would just summarize the parable, what is this parable about? Okay. Imagine if you had a big house okay. and you had employees and you were going away on a trip and you had your most faithful employee that seemed to know what he was doing and you put him in charge of everything, you put him in charge of the other employees or even a business and you have to go away for two weeks and he sends you reports saying, oh, everything is going just wonderfully. Don't worry, enjoy yourself, stay longer, longer if you want to. But then all of a sudden, you hear Aunt Matilda is sick, and so you rush home without telling anyone else, and you open the door to your big business or big house, and the place is, as we say in Hebrew, it's a balagan. It's a big bowl of confusion. It's just nothing has been done. The bills haven't been paid. Uh, the workers haven't been given any lunch. They're in, about to revolt. And your business may go down the tubes because this one guy didn't do what you entrusted him to do. And so it's a, it's a real issue. And not only are there the facts there on the surface that are apparent, but obviously there's a lesson in this for us as well. All right, Umberto, what are your thoughts on this parable? Well, the parable that we're uh, going to be speaking about, I think it speaks about distinct places or positions that we enjoy or that we have in what is our ministry in the body of Christ or for the body of Christ. And again, we'll be reading different types of things. So it talks about faithful servants and unfaithful servants. It also talks about servants that, uh, that are in charge of the whole household, and then servants that just keep the kitchen or servants that just clean the bathroom. You know, there's different types of servants that it's talking about here. Mm -hmm. So in effect, this is a study that, that is very good for the whole church or for the whole body of Christ in, in what regards our position, our place, our responsibilities, and our duties, and eventually our faithfulness to God and what God has called us to do. All right, so when there's a servant to whom much is entrusted <clears throat> and he's negligent, it says cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Cut him in pieces? What's going on? And then assign him a place with the unbelievers. Obviously, if he's cut in pieces, he's... What's going on here? <laughs> I, I don't think that this is referring to a loss of salvation. Um, oftentimes, people will run... Uh, their imaginations run riot with them, uh, especially if you come out of a a theological uh, a tradition which is always threatening people with loss of salvation, a parable like this is going to be powerful ammunition for you because you're going to use it to bludgeon people over the head uh, so that they keep in line and there's no infraction. And I, don't, I believe that's a misuse of this parable. I don't believe it's threatening with a loss of salvation but rather it is the, really the principle that if the Lord has entrusted you with something, 
then you need to be faithful in using that. So I don't think we should be too quick to run and infer that something or some people are being threatened with the loss of salvation. We need to remember that salvation, we are eternally secure. And we don't want to be eternally insecure. And so we need to understand the context. And the context, once again, sorry to sound like that one string violin, but the context is a first century rabbinic concept, context. Did the Pharisees, were they faithful, the, the teachers of the Jewish law, had they been faithful in doing what God had entrusted them to do, which was to teach his word and be a light to the nations? And I think the very sad answer is, oftentimes, no, they had not been. They instead squandered it. So here's the Messiah. He comes to the earth, and what does he find? Does he find faith? No, he finds a big religious system with layers of bureaucracy and layers of I'm the boss, though you're the boss, and very little God activity. Do you think it's possible, either of you, that um, Yeshua is looking at two types of people, the believer and the non-believer? Mm -hmm. And the faithful one is the believer, and the unfaithful one is the non-believer. Therefore, he's not losing his salvation. It's just indicative of the fact that he's a non-believer, and he's going to be punished as a non-believer. Can you see that in there? What about you, Humberto? Well, again, I mean, the actions that he's taken might be the actions of an unbeliever. The Bible does say that that uh, wheat and tares do grow together one mm. with the other. And so there's an appearance as they're, as they're very young and unmature, uh, uh, very much the same. It's hard to distinguish one from the other. But the Bible says ultimately God will send his angels to make a division and he will show the ones that are wheat and the ones that are tares. And again, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Now, one of the important fruits that God is looking in our life is faithfulness. And this is what this, uh, this uh, parable is speaking to. It's speaking about God's desire to see faithfulness in our lives, that it be a part of our daily walk with the Lord and for the Lord. And in any relationship that we see, faithfulness is very important. When a husband chooses a wife, faithfulness is very important. When a wife chooses a husband, faithfulness is very important. And so with God, faithfulness is also very important. He desires for us to be faithful to him, mm. uh, to uphold his word, to look after his kingdom and his desire for the kingdom to grow and to be revealed here on the earth, all of these things. So God is, is looking for a people that will be faithful to him. One of the things that jumps out to me at this, with this parable is the servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready will beaten, be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And for the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. It seems to me to be saying that there's a level of punishment in the afterlife and a level of reward in the afterlife. What do you guys think of that? Well, you skate out, you skate out onto thin ice, to use um, an illustration from, you know, a rural northeast. You skate out onto thin ice when we try to speculate about something like that. And yet, it's hard to dispute what you've just said, that there does seem to be a certain um, difference in, in the level of punishment. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all bad. But it, it reminds me and it echoes uh, the passages in Romans chapter 1 that tell us that what can be seen about God can be seen in nature. Now, it's not the full revelation. Theologians talk about general revelation. Yeah which is the fact that we can look up into the heavens and recognize that these things did not come into existence by accident, but rather they were specifically created. So that is general revelation, the way that a leaf is put together. Specific revelation is the way that God has revealed himself very uh, clearly through the pages of the scripture and through the person of Jesus, the Messiah. Um, there, and, and theologians will argue about this endlessly, 
But there will be people who may never have heard a gospel message. But somehow, if they respond to general revelation, then God will make a way for them to receive enough so that they can respond to his offer of salvation. It didn't, doesn't matter if it was the year, you know, uh, 400 A.D. in the jungles of Brazil. Uh, one way or another, he will give them enough information so that they can call upon the Lord and escape this. And so just as there are levels of reward for believers, it's not a stretch to then imagine that there are levels of punishment for those who consciously uh, just squandered uh, the ability to know the Lord and kind of thumbed their nose at him. It makes sense from a set perspective of justice, even in our, our climate, our, our world, <coughs> somebody who steals a loaf of bread versus somebody who murders. Yes. yes. Worst punishment. It's at the so discretion so, of the judge, and yeah. a wise judge is going to look at this, going to look at the record, going to look at the person's attitude. Are they repentant or are they smirking? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all part of it. But one of the scriptures that we need to hang our hat on is a scripture that says, will not the judge of the whole earth do righteously? Yep, absolutely. So again, justice will be meted out. Uh, a lot of times we can see manifestations of that here on this earth, but if we don't see it here on this earth, it surely <laughs> will be meted out in the world to come. And so that is something that we, is very important for us to recognize that God is a just God and God is interested in justice. And the case that we're talking about, the unfaithful servant, the Bible says, uh, begins to see that his master has gone away hasn't phoned lately, <laughs> he hasn't called lately, he hasn't inquired lately. So the Bible says that he begins to deceive himself. Mm. And then the Bible says he begins to take a different attitude from an attitude mm. that I will answer to my master one day to an attitude, he's never coming back, he probably died, something happened. And then the Bible says his attitude and his actions begin to change. Now he saw the other servants with respect. He saw them as people that were able and capable. He respected their position and their place. But after a time, he begins to lord over them. Mm. And so when he begins to lord over them, now he treats them with disrespect. He treats them with indignity because now he is lord over these people. He's no longer a co-laborer or co-servant, but now he is lord over them. And when we see Jesus and his admonitions, he was always uh, telling us to be careful not to be the, like the rulers of this world because they like to lord over. They mm. like to say, you go, you do, and you come back. But the Bible says that we should never get that attitude or that mindset because eventually there is one Lord, there is one king, and the Bible says we must all render an account to him. So as you and I are sitting in a place of authority, we need to be very careful about recognizing that we are not to act like we're lording over people, but that we are co-laborers with them. That there needs to be a fear in our heart. So if we're very, if it causes us great joy to bring them before us and have them shaken in their boots, we need uh -huh. to be very careful because one day God's going to call us before him. You know, there's a passage that says not many should aspire to be teachers because teachers will have a more severe judgment. Mm -hmm. yes. And then here it says, to whom much is given, much will be required. So I suppose it's the same, the same concept. In a previous episode, we were talking about um, various parts in the body of Messiah, various responsibilities, and some mm -hmm. seem more glorious than the others. Yes. But the consequences are more severe on those that seem more glorious. The also. idea of the quarterback, because yep. you mentioned that, yep. that the quarterback gets a lot of fame, you know, and, and, and whatever. But yes, when things are going well, he probably gets more credit than he should. <laughs> but it also happens the other way. When things are going bad, he probably gets more blame than he should. Yeah. This, um, it seems severe when it says cut him in pieces. Did either of you guys, you know, did you wrestle with that when you studied this out? 
Again, when, when I look at that, uh, to me, it, it always implies eventually what will happen with them. Eventually, I think there's an implication of the ultimate what will happen. And ultimately, there is a division between goats and sheep. There is a division between terries and wheat. And we can put it as pretty as we want or as nice as you want, but we're talking about heaven and we're talking about hell. We're talking about salvation and we're talking again about eternal damnation. So eventually, that is, I think, an allusion to that. So there are allusions to the fact that there is an eternal judgment and there are eternal consequences that are connected with that judgment. There's a lot of people today denying that. A lot of preachers coming out saying there is no such thing as eternal judgment. Right. The punishment from God will be decisive, but it'll be temporary. It'll be right. over. People right. will be judged and annihilated. Yeah. So, I don't know, language like cut them in pieces and assign them with the place of the unbeliever, that sounds pretty severe to me. We got a couple minutes. Why don't we jump into this concept of whether or not God's wrath, God's punishment, hell, is for real, according to Scripture. <laughs> okay. And whether it's eternal or not, I'm sure you guys have dealt with it. Where do you come off on this with your people? You know, in uh, Jerusalem, my wife and I lived in Jerusalem for several months years ago when we attended school there. And along the southern edge of the city, there is a valley. And that valley um, is where they would burn the garbage. You would yeah. literally, you could literally throw the garbage over the wall, eventually it would make its way to the, to the bottom of that, that valley, and there would always be like smoke coming from the valley at all times. It's a pretty, pretty deep chasm, and it has kind of a V at the bottom. It's been filled in now over the years. It's kind of built up. But uh, there were fires going day and night, and you just threw your garbage down that hill. And that is the allusion, with an A, allusion, to which uh, Scripture talks about being punished in that way. And it's, you know, why use that language if there wasn't uh, a, a real sense that the punishment is going to be conscious, number one, which is what some people deny in a recent popular book, that swept one end of the Christian market, right. that, you know, love wins, and so we don't have to, to ever be concerned about punishment. Well, it basically, the fellow who wrote that cherry-picked certain verses and ignored other passages. Yeah. And that's a dishonest way to approach the Word of God. We don't do that. We need to get a balanced way. For example, a lot of people, when they describe the love of God on, on the cross and all of these, you know, they bring out a lot the love of God and the mercy of God. And yes, at the cross, we see the love of God and we see the mercy of God towards us. But we not only see the love and the mercy, but we also see the justice of God there revealed. Why? Because what you and I deserved was brought over into Jesus, into his body, into his own being. So what was a mercy to us was a miserable punishment to him. But both things were yeah. there meted out, not only love and mercy, but righteousness and truth and justice. The justice of God required that, that the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so Calvary not only reveals to us the love of God and the mercy of God, but it also reveals to us how God judges sin. Mm -hmm. And how does God judge sin? God judges sin so evil and wicked that he would even visit it upon his son, that punishment wow. and that yep. cross and all that. And we can never lose sight of that. That's a good point. Why do we always focus in on what the cross did for us when we don't think about what it was doing to Yeshua? And the reality is if we do that, we really don't have the effect that we need to have. Yeah. The way that we have the effect is when we recognize that he was holy, he was pure, he was without sin, and he was placed on the cross. Now, if, if, if I wanted to make an impact of having somebody on a cross, I mean, it's bad enough to see somebody suffering in that fashion, in that manner. But imagine instead of having a burly, you know, bad, evil-looking guy, imagine having a little baby hung up there. Mm. How much more powerful would that image be? Yeah. And that's precisely what we hung on the cross. 
innocent, perfect, without mm -hmm. sin, without blemish. That's who was hung on the cross. When I think of uh, eternal life, I don't say, gee, I wonder when it'll end or it's decisively going to end. <laughs> but when we talk about eternal punishment, as M Muddle mentioned, popular book, the same word is used for both. In uh, Matthew 25, it says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Sure. Same verse, same Greek word, one referring to punishment, one referring to life, and yet we take half of it and say eternal doesn't mean eternal, and we take yeah. the other one and say eternal, of course, means eternal. Yeah, and that's cherry picking, and that's yeah. uh, a dishonest use of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Scripture is internally consistent. A very, very important phrase to understand. Scripture is internally consistent. And it doesn't say one thing and mean one thing in one part of Scripture and say the same thing and mean something else that you want it to mean in a different part of Scripture. It's internally consistent, and that's why we Bible props will often say, we first attempt to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Look for other instances of the same sort of set of words, the same word. How is it used in other places? Just to do a little hermeneutic study here. How is it used in other places? Don't immediately go looking for proof texts mm -hmm. for your doctrine. Instead, let the scriptures first inform your doctrine. We don't want to just be uh, after the fact looking for proof texts. Well, here's what I often hear people say. We all agree God is love. How could a loving God punish somebody for all of eternity? That doesn't make sense. He wouldn't be loving if he did that. And so they take the doctrine of love mm -hmm. and use that over and against the doctrine of eternal punishment. How do, how do you address that? Well, I think the reality of, of who we are, or how we're made, might maybe have something to do with it. Maybe, maybe there's something about an eternal being that it, to a certain sense uh, cannot just be snuffed out or whatever. Maybe somehow there is an eternity, but we choose where we will spend that eternity. And so in that sense, I mean, there we must end up someplace. And again, uh, and again, for that, God gives us a choice whether we would choose life or whether we would choose death. Now, I've always thought about a scripture in Revelation that describes how, how uh, terrible the time of the great tribulation will be. I mean, we're talking about fire, we're talking about famine, we're talking about war, I mean, all kinds of misery. In the midst of that, the Bible describes a people that are clenching their te teeth and, and blaspheming God in the midst of their anguish, in the midst of a type of hell here on earth, they're still blaspheming God. And when I read that, I say, well, that's probably a reason why there's got to be a hell. Because these people, even in the midst of that misery, they still don't repent. They still will not leave their evil ways. And so what will be the consequence about taking an individual like that and putting them in heaven? Well, he'd be trying to rip off the, the, the golden <laughs> streets. I mean, he'd be, he would be miserable. He yeah. would not be happy there. Because, again, he is not repentant. He is unconverted. And so goodness to him would not be good. It would be boring. So again, I think there are reasons why there must be this separation. I, I get that, and I agree with it, but I'm playing devil's advocate. Yep. No, it's a hard concept, without a doubt. And in the end, if a person is absorbed with the idea of someone suffering for eternity, there's no human words you're going to utter to, to take that conviction away. And at a certain point, <clears throat> I'm not going to invest too much energy or effort to try to take that conviction away. Hopefully, there will come a time when, if they dwell on that long enough and they're not believers, <clears throat> it will move them to what they need to do. <clears throat> and that's what, it needs to, that, what, that's what needs to happen. And also, I would say this, uh, because again, the, maybe people would say that we like that or we want that to be a reality. Let me say it right now. I hope that I'm wrong, and I hope they don't suffer for eternity. Right? I do. Yeah. I have never met an individual that I would say, well, he's the exception. Let him suffer. I wouldn't. 
So to begin with, this is not something that we made up or we hope is the reality. I don't. Does that mean that I'm better than God or more just than God? No. It means that I'm way blinder than God. I really yeah. don't know the full purpose of why it's got to be that way. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I do know is that God is not going to be mocked. And one thing I know, God is never wrong. And so he is perfect in everything that he does, even though I may not understand it. One of the things I like to point out is the scripture says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Yes. Mm. And um, no human has to go there. And God doesn't want any human to go there. Yes. And he has done everything and will do everything within his power to keep people from going there, even to the point of sending his own son to die for our sins. Right. So even <coughs> though we don't like the concept of an eternal hell, it is what the scripture clearly presents. Mm. And nobody has to go. That's right. So it's kind of silly to argue about it on the one hand when nobody has to really go there. No, I think we would be remiss if we didn't also push out to the front one more concept that this parable talks about. Because it talks about the sudden return, the unexpected, out of the blue, unannounced, sudden return of the master and he comes and he looks and things are not in order. There's a passage in um, 2 Peter, and it's 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 10, that uses the same sort of language about what's happening with this master, and it's talking about the return of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, which says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away, with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and its works will all be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people should you all be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed? So what kind of people should we be? God-fearing, <laughs> holy, obedient people. Yes. God-fearing, though. Yes. And that's the thing. He's coming back, and he left as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion. lion. That's right. He was forbearing and patient and loving, and he's given people every and all opportunities to repent. But if we don't, that's upon our shoulders. Yeah. Yes. Well, we've just started looking at the parables. We've got many more to look at, so I hope we'll see you right on the other side. God bless. And welcome back to The Shepherd's Heart. We've been analyzing the parables of Yeshua, and uh, pretty much on each side we've been looking at a new one. Mm -hmm. So we're in uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 7, and he said he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, so he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast... Don't take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. Hmm. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. And then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Okay, Umberto, what are your thoughts on this? Well, again, this is a, a teaching to try to correct a, a very common uh, practice uh, for us as human beings. And that's the practice to suppose <laughs> that we are more important than we really are, that we are more of that than what we really are. And so it was a desire for the Lord to save us from shame, to save us from being put to shame. So he was teaching us this teaching. And again, it happened because the Bible says he was invited to a dinner. Mm -hmm. And so when he was invited to a dinner, he noticed that some other people were choosing the place of honor. And again, this was a common thing that he saw where he was going. So he wanted to bring correction to that. And he wanted to help his disciples and everyone that would hear to save themselves from shame. And again, this is the purpose of the commandments of God. Why were the commandments of God given? To save us from ruin and from shame and from destruction. This is the purpose of the teaching. It's not to make your life miserable. It's not to make your life boring. It's to save you from a lot of headache. 
it's kind of nice. It's very practical. Yeah. It's to keep us from getting embarrassed and humiliated. <laughs> yeah. He says, don't do that. And, and on the other side, there's an opportunity to be honored. Yes. Because if you take the lowest seat, yes. they're going to come and, you know, promote you a wee bit, even to a better seat. And again, this is a very common thing. I think uh, whenever people sit down, like, for example, in the Seder, I believe they have a seat that is called a seat of honor. Well, in the modern Seder, they have Elijah's seat, and that's, okay. that's only reserved for him. In the ancient, um, they called the, uh, the, the seating arrangements, um, you sat on a cliné okay. or recliner, and uh, there were usually about three of them set around a table, and they had a seat of honor, and then they had a second seat of honor, mm -hmm. right. and then the further away you got from the <laughs> seat of honor, the lower in rank you got, exactly. so you were at the other end. And so, again, these are interesting things. I believe also the, the way maybe that they were sitting around the table with the Lord Jesus Christ, I've heard an implication that may, maybe Judas was seated at a very special seat of honor. And that depended, I think, upon uh, the way that he was able to give him, you know, the bread. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they said, well, he's probably pretty close, so how's he going to give it to him? So, again, these kind of things. But, again, the seat of honor, the Bible says, is something that God is in his authority to give to whoever he wants. And we can remember that the disciples were kind of always having a struggle to see who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And it got so bad that the Bible says and James and John even got their mama involved or else their mama, <laughs> <laughs> or else their mama is the one that got them involved, right. one or the other, right? Yeah. And so the Bible says they come to him and says, Lord, we have a small request to ask of you. And the Lord says, oh, well, what is it? Just a small uh, request. Just a small one. It's not very large, you know, but you can, maybe you can help us out. And, 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 they, and they tell him, they say, well, Lord, that when your kingdom come, one of my children will sit on your left side and one on your right side. I mean, they wanted the, the best and those seats. those are the two seats. The, the best seats. They yep. wanted the best seats in the house. Yep. And so the Lord Jesus Christ said, well, you know, it's quite of a large thing that you're asking. Yeah, that's he small. said, but it's not given to me to give that, but my father has it already ordained for someone. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if it's your children or not. And then he says something else to them. He says, but are you able to drink of the cup that I am able to drink of? That is to say, you want a place of honor, but are you willing to go through the process that is necessary in order to get that place yeah. of honor. Because the Bible says if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us also. And so the Bible is telling them, are you willing to, to pass through the fire that is necessary in order to have that place mm -hmm. in the sea. Because we, we think that, that we don't have to do anything for it, that somehow it, we just deserve it and it's going to be given to us. But yet this place of honor, the Bible says there's a process to, to get it. So in, in our culture today, is there anything equivalent to seats of honor? Are there ways to promote ourselves and then be embarrassed or to demote ourselves and then be promoted and be honored. How, how would you put that in today's language and I, experience? I have um, some friends who have um, their company has um, season tickets to a certain sports stadium. I won't mention because if you're not a fan of that, then I'll get, angry get hate mail. Get hate mail. <laughs> if you're not a New York Yankees fan. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I have heard of an incident where a certain employee expected that the boss would take him to a, one of the playoff games and he would be able to sit in the box seat with the boss at their private booth there looking at the game. And later on, I was told by a, a friend who was privy to the situation that that individual was very embarrassed because he showed up expecting to sit in the private box and turned out that they had a block of 20 general admission seats that they gave to the other employees. Uh, and that's what he got. Perfect example. And he had kind of let it known that, oh, I'm sitting with the boss today. Uh, and all of a sudden, when he was handed the general, you know, the $12 ticket, he just kind of put his, you know, the head down and filed in with the rest of the employees. So something that's very common, it can happen. I went to Nicaragua about uh, a month ago. And uh, as I was speaking with my friend from Nicaragua, and he's, he, has, he has a very good place in Christian circles and in all Nicaragua. He's a, a leader of a, um, a council of pastors, evangelical pastors, has about 6,000 member churches to it. 
So he's very well known. And they invited him once uh, to come meet at the president. He was having some function going on. And so he came uh, to, to sit at his place and someone else was sitting in that place. He knows this individual. And this individual does like to sit at that place. Ah. <laughs> and so uh, when he came to that place, the organizer was trying to pick him up, but he saw that individual. He said, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm fine right here. I, I, I want to sit right here. It was a special place for him. But that person said, no, that place has been reserved for you. No, nobody else can sit there. And so this person went up to speak to that gentleman. He said, you're sitting. Somebody else has said, didn't you know? And when he got up, the pastor's name was written right in the back. They had, uh -huh. they had a thing with it. And they, had, they caused him to sit down, even though my friend was saying, please, you're going to embarrass him. Yeah, all this. Yeah. I'm fine where I'm at. But he said, no, it can't be that way. That place is yours. I've been reserved for you, and no one else can take it. And so they made this guy get up in the middle of thousands of people, and you sit down right there and had him sit down. So again, it happens all the time because the word of God cannot fail. He earned his embarrassment for that day, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. There's a passage in um, Romans chapter 12 that I think is pertinent to this whole idea of exalting oneself. So I'm going to read from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself mm -hmm. than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So here, people are actually told in, in didactic black and white terms, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. It's, you know, it's, it's a foolish sort of thing. Uh, there's an old Jewish joke. You can't let this whole series go without one <laughs> Jewish joke. Um, Jewish boy, kind of a mama's boy, you know, he's still a mama's boy. He decides he's going to go on eBay and get an admiral's outfit. And uh, he wants to strut around in his admiral's outfit. So he puts on his admiral's outfit. It's got all the fancy insignia. And he struts around. He makes a sign for himself. Uh, and he goes to his parents, who just give him everything he wants. And he says, how do I look? And his uh, mama says, well... To daddy, you look like an admirable, ad, admiral. To me, you look like an admiral. But to an admiral, you don't look like an admiral. Uh. And from God's vantage, we look foolish. Strutting Tr around in strutting our costumes. around <laughs> in our rags, yeah. trying to exalt ourselves as though, as the kids say, we're all that. We're the mangy chicken thinking we're the peacock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it goes. Well, my favorite passage on this whole humidi humility thing is Philippians chapter 2. I know you guys know it. It says, in your relationships, uh, have the same mindset as Messiah Yeshua, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, mm. being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Messiah Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's our example in everything. He's our example in humility. Mm -hmm. He was God in human flesh. Yes. But he was very happy to just step aside, take on the hu human form. <laughs> Can you imagine? No, we can't imagine. Mm. What's it like to be God one day and the next day be a, a mewling baby in a manger yeah. and to suffer as a human suffers? I, I can't imagine. 
So again, the Lord shows us the way to greatness and to be exalted because the Bible says he has a name that's above all names. Yeah. And again, you got to see how lowly he went in order to be raised up so high. And again, how lowly are we willing to go to attain those high places? Because the Bible says if you want to be the greatest, you must be the least. If you want to be the first, you must be the last. And we don't like to be the last, but yet we still want to be the first. But the Bible says you can't have one without the other. And so again, what the Lord Jesus Christ received from the Father is because he was willing to humble himself so much. If you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, just imagine him washing the feet of the disciples. Yeah. Just imagine what that's like. Have you ever tried to wash the feet of men that have been walking down the road hmm. full of dirt, you know, all day long, and you're sitting there, and you're going to wash their feet? Can you imagine the stink? Can you imagine what, hmm. what that's like? And yet the Bible says the creator of the universe did that. We can see very clearly why Peter objected and said, you'll never wash my feet. Because he just could never imagine that that could be possible. But yet the Lord was showing him the way to be exalted and the way of greatness. Mm -hmm. I heard somewhere that that foot washing job was for the lowest of the low. Mm. If you were the lowest ser servant on the totem pole, that was your job. That's and so here's the king of the universe. Amazing. God in human flesh. And what's he do? He gets born as a baby, but not as a Roman senator's baby. <laughs> he picks an oppressed people, the like Jewish people. And not just, he's not born a priest or a Levite. He's not born into a wealthy family. He's born into a poor family. Yeah. A poor family that's presently displaced from their home. <laughs> don't even have a place to put their heads. And born in a manger. Exactly. And then he grows up, and as you say, he takes off his robe, washes the feet of the disciples, use his robe to dry their feet, I imagine. Yeah. And the scripture says, let this mind be in you. Mm. Mm. If I have washed your feet, yeah. you also ought to wash one another's feet. Exactly. So give the way of humility, and, and, a way, and we can't be exalted without humility. That's the point. If you want exaltation, this seems... Um, this seems contrary, but yet this is what the Bible shows time and time again. The Bible says if you humble yourself, you're going to be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. And we've gave uh, already a couple of examples. The Bible says in James uh, chapter 5 and verse 6, Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, hmm. but gives grace to the humble. So the Bible says that God is opposing, in other scriptures it says, resists the proud. So it's speaking about God actually wrestling with the proud mm -hmm. individual. God actually opposing his plans, op opposing his purposes. And I believe that in, in a battle between you and God, you're never going to win. <laughs> you're always going to lose. So it is better to lose so that you can win. And there is that principle in the Bible. The Bible says that if you and I are willing to lose, we can win. The Bible says if you lose your life, you will gain it, but if you gain your life, you will lose it. So as we are humbling ourselves, we're losing our life. But the Bible says through that losing, we gain. In Micah chapter 5, in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, mm -hmm. and to walk humbly with your God. Humility is a foundational virtue. Every other virtue in our faith is built upon humility. So if the foundation's no good, then the rest, well, you won't really have the, the rest of the building. Mm -hmm. So I think for with some of the remaining time we have, we should talk about practical ways to grow in humility. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. <laughs> I like these witticisms, yes, these brilliant yes. little statements. So you've got disciples, you've got parishioners, you've got friends, and you've got to give them a lesson on how to actually practically grow in humility. What might you tell them? I think that it's important for people to see, in especially in the context of a local congregation, that anything that the pastor would ask them to do, he has first done himself when the church was smaller, mm. and he would be willing to do it now. 
So the pastor is never going to ask someone to do something that he hasn't already experienced or that he is not willing to do himself right now. But it's wise to have a division of responsibilities. Sure, yeah. And so it is the way of humility to have experienced all of those tasks in the congregation. Um, case in point, um, each summer I co-teach uh, with Dr. Arnold Furchtenbaum. He's a, a internationally known Bible scholar. He has about literally 20 full-length scholarly books to his name. And we co-teach in a Bible school that takes place for three weeks each summer. The place has grown, and now we have about 18 to 20 employees there each summer to help with the food service and everything else. But 40 years ago, when this summer Bible program first got started, there were no employees. Sure. And he and his wife did a large number of the tasks so that the school could grow. And he taught, in addition, here he is, recent graduate of a top seminary. He's teaching four hours of Bible a day. Plus, he's also doing menial tasks to get the, the thing up and running. But the Lord saw that, honored that, blessed it, and the place grew in numbers so that they were able to eventually hire staff. But when he, you know, sometimes you'll just see him walk by and there's one of the, the teenagers going to clean a bathroom. Forty years ago, when he was in his 20s, recent seminar grad, he was cleaning bathrooms in addition to Bible cleaning, in addition to Bible teaching. So humility starts with recognizing that work for the kingdom of God, there's nothing to be ashamed of it. It's all honest work for the it's kingdom okay of God. It's okay to clean bathrooms. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I am. Um, wrestled with this passage recently and I came up with six ways to grow in humility that I shared with my congregation. Great. So if I can share them with you guys, Please. we have time, we can talk through some of them. I'll go through the list and then we can start at the beginning and maybe work, mm -hmm. work our way through them. Uh, first is acknowledge your weakness or weaknesses. Second is to put others first. The third is to ask for advice. Hmm. The fourth is to admit when you're wrong. Wow. The fifth is to offer and accept forgiveness. And the sixth was no gloating or criticizing. Now, these aren't the only six that anybody could come up with, of course. Mm -hmm. But there were six that I thought were, 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 were quite useful. And I try to base them all, of course, on Bible verses. Acknowledging our weaknesses, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It makes sense to me that you cannot be humble if you don't acknowledge your circumstance, mm. your weaknesses. Lower, uh, lower down it says uh, that if we say that we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar. Mm -hmm. well, that's pretty, pretty bad. No humility there. So we have to acknowledge. I, I love this thing about the uh, alcoholics and the addicts. The first step for them is admitting they have yeah. a problem. No. And believe it or not, a lot of alcoholics, we'll just use them as a reference for all the, the sure. addictions. They don't recognize they have a problem. Everybody knows they have a problem. Yes. They're the only ones who don't. But when they finally acknowledge it, then there's room for hope. Yeah. All right, so the first point to grow in humility is acknowledge your sinfulness, your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Second, put others first. And this is from the humility passage in Philippians 2 that I just read from mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Each of you, it says, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Mm -hmm. So can you think of an instance or an elucidation of this to help grow in humility by putting other people's interests first? I think when you love your wife, you naturally want to put, put, put her first, you know. I think that's part of love and, and humility. I think it's very natural to see men, and I usually see that you were talking in another episode about uh, seeing these shows where they're making up houses and all that. They've got a lot of these shows where they're choosing the house or the place. If you notice, the majority of times, the husband will do what the wife wants. Yep. <laughs> That's a wise husband. <laughs> and a lot of these, I would say, maybe are not even Christian. I don't know who they are. But yet, it's this natural thing to, to want to please her, you know. Yeah. And and it's very, it's a wonderful thing when, when a woman recognizes that. And that is a weakness in a man. 
but as his expression of love for her, real mm-hmm. expression. So I think it's something to be need to be honored and respected. Put others first. And when we do that, you know, like the example you gave earlier of this guy who took somebody else's seat yeah. because he wanted to promote himself. Yeah. Why wasn't he thinking, gee, somebody else could sit here, yeah. right? This, this is a good seat. I'll give it to somebody else. But that's how you deceive yourself, and yeah. that's why you fall into the trap. The Bible says after that pride comes. Yep. Mm-hmm. So we put others' interests in front of ourselves. It's an act of humility. And like you said about a previous topic, sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, our heart follows our actions. That's right. This would be the same. Maybe you're not feeling particularly humble, but you think about other people and do for them first, and eventually your heart will follow your actions. Yes. All right, third piece of advice Arrogance causes nothing but trouble. It's wiser to ask for advice. Arrogance is the opposite of somebody who asks for advice. So my advice is for growing in humility is ask for advice. Mm -hmm. A pastor is not beyond this. Um, I've seen a pastor get into a problem because he imagined that everything he did was correct. Only when it became painfully obvious that a few of the steps that he took were wrong, would he grudgingly admit that they were wrong? Uh, but the damage had already been done and two families had already left. Um, you know, you, if you don't put yourself on a pedestal, you will have the opportunity to realize that you're just another servant along with everyone else. Now, yes, you may have a skill set that de- that's the reason why you're behind the podium, because you have the skill set and the discipline to study the scriptures during the week, to come up with a message that's going to make sense, and to have clarity of of thought and expression to be able to deliver that message so that people can hear it, digest it, and come back. That's a skill set, but you still have to have the same humility as the folks who take care of the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, And eventually, if you don't, the church becomes a personality cult. How about this? You're a 30-year-old pastor at a mega church, and the janitor is a 65-year-old uneducated man. Sure. Can you ask him for advice? Oh, absolutely. Well, even if you're educated and he's not? No, because he's lived a lifetime, and the Lord has brought him through things that you have not been through. Uh, We don't want congregations that are personality cults. And listen, we're not naming any names, but there are whole ministries that are built around the personality of one individual. And uh, if that guy is off the scene, there's no reason for the ministry to exist. It's all around his personality. And I don't think that's ever a good thing. Now, you can perhaps cite different good things that came about in that ministry, but overall, it's not a healthy situation. Uh, And so we need to be... Again, as the scripture says, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such scorn from people who were sinners. They're scorning the holy man of God, the holy son of God. Consider him so that you don't lose heart. If he went through it, totally undeserving of any scorn, we all should expect to go through it. There will be times when the criticism will be unfair. We all three of us know that goes with the territory, that goes with ministry. People will often assume the worst for your motivations. You go to uh, try to implement a program People will look toward, oh, you, what's, your, what's your angle on your this? Your hidden agenda what's for self-serving. Hidden yeah. agenda. What's, what's, what's the, what, what are you not telling us? Yeah. And you've got to, in a godly way, encourage people to follow where the so God Just is remember going. in this thing, as far as believers, remember that it's not about a head, it's about a body. I like to put it that way. That's right. That's not right. about a head, it's about a body. Speaking about the church here in, uh, in the earth, it's not just about a head, it's about a body. It, it requires the whole body. The whole body's involved in the same thing. And the Bible says each and every one of us will get our reward. So it's not about a head. It's about the body. No, we didn't have time to talk through all six of these. <laughs> but you can think on them at home. 
Six ways to grow in humility. Acknowledge your weaknesses or sins. Second is put others first. Third is ask for advice. The fourth is admit when you're wrong. The fifth is offer and accept forgiveness. And the sixth is no gloating or criticizing. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Mm. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. For the Lord will see it and be displeased. Mm. These are the types of things we talk about on the shepherd's heart. We're going through the parables of Yeshua. We hope you'll join us next time. May God bless you as you seek the shepherd's heart. We'll see you then. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you enjoy this show, we need your support to keep this series on GLC. Please make your checks out to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.